factories in Africa, roads in Kazakhstan, oil refineries in Iran, and ports in Greece. Just a few of the Belt and Road projects that have been built in the last decade. Projects that have not only changed recipient countries, but also changed global trade. ASEAN has become the biggest uh, trading partner of China. ASEAN has been greatly connected with China. The Belt and Road has brought celebration to some, despair to others. In the last few years especially, we've seen an astonishing number of loans that have been assessed as non-performing and have been written off. As China marks 10 years of the BRI, Insight examines how it has changed the world and how it will evolve moving forward. It was Central Asia's cradle of culture for more than two millennia. Uzbekistan, home to a storied history and a wealth of architectural wonders from days of old. But its modern history is far less romantic. For 60 years, Uzbekistan had been closed to the world. It was only in 2017 when things changed. Uzbekistan today is uh, conducting very serious reforms. I can even compare that with Chinese historical periods when they had the opening up. Leading the charge is China, who want Uzbekistan in on its Belt and Road master plan. When President Xi made his first overseas trip in September 2022, after more than three years, it was to Uzbekistan and neighboring Kazakhstan that he went, underscoring the importance of Central Asia to China. I think if we look at the map, uh, we can find that the, uh, the importance of Central Asia in a BRI, because it, it would be the first stop for China to go out from China on the road of the uh, belt. And also Central Asia region is a very, very important area, not only for Chinese economy, especially for Chinese security. Launched in September 2013, the Belt and Road Initiative is China's global infrastructure development project with the goal of extending the country's trade links. It involves three quarters of all the countries around the world and over a trillion US dollars of investments. Well, the Belt and Road Initiative was one of Xi Jinping's signature global initiatives at its peak it involved hundreds of billions of dollars worth of investment, and it was even written into the Chinese constitution. So it was one of the initiatives with which President Xi was most associated, and for a while, it was one of the most successful. One of the largest China-backed special economic zones in Central Asia is this. Pengsheng is a 100 million US dollar project that includes multiple factories, churning out shoes, leather products, ceramic tiles, and water taps. Pengsheng employs over 1,300 Uzbek workers and about 200 Chinese workers. China's investments in Uzbekistan extend far beyond the special economic zone. The two countries have signed some 15 billion US dollars worth of investment deals 
on jointly developing the country's oil, gas and uranium fields. They also agreed to cooperate in building railways, road networks, telecommunications infrastructure and industrial parks. China is our major trade partner at the moment. And of course, when we're talking about investments, especially foreign direct investments, China is also number one. Uzbekistan's neighbor, Kazakhstan, is another important stop on China's Belt and Road Initiative. It was here that President Xi first proposed the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013. And since then, there has been many notable projects including railways and highways that connect China to Russia and also Europe, as well as a crude oil pipeline and a Central Asia gas pipeline. According to China state media, China once received 30% of its natural gas imports through the China Central Asia pipeline. In other Central Asian countries like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, China's engagement is also on full display. With multiple highways, railways, mines and energy projects across the region. As of the end of March, China's direct investment stock in Central Asia stood at over $15 billion. Trade between China and the five Central Asian countries set a record high in 2022. Well, Central Asia is uh, strategically located between China and Europe. You know, it's, uh, it's, if you talk about uh, ancient times Silk Road, if you talk about uh, current uh, China-EU uh, uh, railway uh, transit, you know, Central Asia is, is uh, vital. The significance of the Belt and Road Initiative here extends way beyond connectivity, investment or even jobs. May 2023, just as the leaders of G7 convened in Japan for their yearly summit, Chinese President Xi Jinping hosted his own top-level gathering with the leaders of five Central Asian nations. I do think that China is trying to sell the emerging world in particular, so Central Asia, but also Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, on a different vision of world order, um, and one which is more compatible with China's interests, trying to persuade these countries that the world that China wants to build will be better than the one that the United States and its partners have presided over for most of the last century. Central Asian nations were always closer to Russia after their independence from the Soviet Union. Significant populations from the Stans work in Russia, and the Russian language is commonly spoken across the countries. But the conflict in Ukraine has set the wheels in motion for greater Chinese influence. What you saw in Central Asia is a lot of Central Asian countries looking at what happened to Ukraine, another former part of the Soviet Union, and thinking, well, might we be next? Um, and therefore, what are our options? If we want to signal to Russia that we have other friends, who do we go to? And the answer is that you go to China. China, on the other hand, will have seen uh, the Russian war with Ukraine as an opening, although China is um, a close ally of Russia um, and has been tacitly supporting Russia in the war. Uh, it also sees an opportunity to build its own influence uh, in these countries that are uh, to some degree more nervous about Russian power and what Vladimir Putin might be up to in his immediate neighborhood. Russia itself is also increasingly dependent on Beijing to survive Western isolation and punitive measures. French President Emmanuel Macron's comments that Moscow is, in fact, becoming a vassal state of China went viral in China. With many Chinese citizens agreeing that Russia is now the junior partner in the bilateral relationship. When President Xi visited Moscow in March 2023, he invited President Putin for the Belt and Road Forum and also pledged to significantly increase trade between the two countries. Bilateral trade saw an annual rise of 29.3% to 190 billion US dollars in 2022. There's also been some large investments in Russia in the last decade of the BRI. 
China's largest SUV producer, Great Wall Motors invested $500 million in a plant in Russia. Since 2019, the high-tech production line has been churning out Haval cars. Events in Ukraine gave the company an unexpected boost. As Western and Japanese rivals pulled back, the Chinese automaker's revenue in Russia rose 73% on year to reach 1.25 billion US dollars in 2022. Правительство Тульской области во главе с губернатором Тульской области, которому отдельное спасибо, сделало такие условия для ведения бизнеса, которые просто не оставили нам шанса, кроме того, как прийти сюда на Тульскую землю. Нам дали и налоговые льготы, и таможенные льготы, и помощь в трудоустройстве персонала, и другие выгодные условия, которые позволили нам развиваться и производить здесь качественную продукцию. We see the trade between China and Russia has gone up in the last number of years. So I think there's a lot of also supplementary, complementary, uh, you know, between the two countries on, in terms of the resources, in, self, uh, in terms of the energy, in terms of uh, connect. So I see Russia uh, will still play some active role in promoting the Belt and Road Initiative. Russia, on its part, is also more than enthusiastic about the Belt and Road Initiative. With President Putin famously declaring that the West is failing, and the crucible of global growth was now in Asia. Russia needs China even before the war in Ukraine because it's a major export market for energy. Uh, they also have defense cooperation and a number of other sort of partnerships in industrial areas. Uh, so that's the, and then after Ukraine that became even more important um, because China was really Russia's only significant international partner beyond Iran and a small handful of others. From railways in Indonesia and Laos to a brand new port in Timor-Leste to an entire city in Cambodia's Sihanoukville that is now dominated by Chinese businesses. China's Belt and Road Initiative has left its marks across the region. ASEAN has become the biggest uh, trading partner of China. ASEAN has been greatly connected with China. As China built a web of connectivity through its railways, roads and ports, trade between China and the region exploded. In the year 2000, before the Belt and Road Initiative, trade between China and ASEAN was 40 billion US dollars. In 2022, trade between China and ASEAN was 975 billion US dollars, reaching almost a trillion dollars. Chinese investment in ASEAN has been increasing steadily really since the 2000s. Um, and I would say the Belt and Road Initiative just catalyzed that further um, and, and has facilitated it with a number of infrastructure investments as well. Um, and we, when we look at Chinese investment and trade with, with ASEAN, it's quite uneven, right? So many of the more developed countries in the region, places like Indonesia and Malaysia, they have a wide range of relationships when it comes to trade, so they're actually a lot less reliant on trade with China. But it's the countries right next to China, countries like Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, even Vietnam, where um, connectivity makes a big difference to their trade. And those are the countries that have become especially integrated with, uh, with China through major increases in trade. One example of how the BRI has impacted Southeast Asia can be found in the story of one of the region's most beloved fruits. The buyer of these durians is JD.com. It is one of the largest e-commerce players in China rivaled only by Alibaba's Taobao. เมื่อก่อนมันมีมีมีเยอะมาตอนนี้ตอนนี้คนจีนเข้ามาในประเทศไทยเยอะก่อนหน้านี้ประมาณประมาณ
ตั้งแต่เท่ากับจีนมาเข้ามาเมืองไทยนะก็ชีวิตดีขึ้นมีกิ๊กเยอะกิ๊กเยอะมีอะไรอีกอ่ะตั้งแต่แบบชีวิตดีขึ้นมีอะไรอีกบ้างมีกิ๊กมีรถเพิ่มอ during the years of the pandemic demand for durian spiked as the Chinese ordered novel food products through online platforms like JD. According to data from the Ministry of Commerce of Thailand, China imported over three billion US dollars worth of durians in 2022 and was the largest export market for Thai durians. One factor for its success is how Thai farmers have capitalized on the digital silk road. On the JD Fresh website in China, the search for durians result in hundreds of hits with durians of every imaginable size and breed. The fruit's journey from Thailand to more than 600 cities in China demonstrate the connectivity of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's a journey that would not have been possible 10 years ago, before the BRI, as the durians would have rotted during transportation. Now, from Thailand to Yunnan, and then sorted and shipped to the rest of China, it only takes about six days to deliver the durians to customers' hands. The Laos-China rail link is a critical component of the logistical link. Trade and connectivity is one aspect of the BRI story in Southeast Asia. The other major area of investment has been in energy. Here, at the Stang Rusai Trum River, Chinese energy company Hua Tian operates a 132-megawatt hydropower dam. For many locals, reliable electricity is, of course, welcome. With little greenhouse emissions, some people consider dams to be clean energy. But these dams have profound consequences on the river flow. Jeff Operman authored a report on this subject. Together with his wife and children, Jeff traveled the Mekong to study the effects of the dam. What are impacts upstream? So when a dam is built, it backs up water and it creates a reservoir or backs up the water and raises the water level. And so it will flood out uh, the, the wetlands, the forests that are along the river or people's villages become inundated, become flooded, and they have to move. The effects of the dam downstream are also getting increasing attention. Dams in general fundamentally change the way rivers work. 
And so they negatively affect many of those processes that allow rivers to be such productive engines of, of, of food. For example, a lot of the most important fish that people catch in the Mekong are migratory. They travel long distances to find the right habitat to spawn, and then the eggs will float down or the juvenile will float down. And of course, a dam will serve as a barrier that will prevent fish from coming. So if there's people that live uh, up in Laos, uh, in northern Laos, let's say, and there's a dam lower on the river, they'll no longer have access to the migratory fish because the, the fish will be more or less stopped uh, by the dam. Tongle Sap Lake is an important downstream point on the Mekong River that is home to about 80,000 people. Come December, families across Cambodia begin the season for making fish paste. But this tradition is now under threat from a growing ecological crisis. Data shows that the freshwater fish catch here has dropped 31% in 2020. Cambodia's annual fish catch is worth an estimated 600 million US dollars. Thuan Heng has been fishing on the lake for the last 20 years. Catching fish at the Tonna Sap was simple. Drop a cone-shaped net into the water and wait. Within a few hours, a big catch should be ready. But things are now changing. So the Tonle Sap is this incredible, kind of the beating hearts of the Mekong system. And what's remarkable about that is that the Mekong, when it's flooding, the Mekong gets so high that the Tonle Sap River, essentially, rather than flowing downstream into the Mekong, it hits this wall of water of the rising Mekong and begins to flow backwards. So it's a river that reverses course. And as that river flows backwards, now it's bringing Mekong water up into the Tonle Sap Lake. And the lake expands. And there's an entire forest that gets submerged. And you can ride around on a boat and look down at treetops, and the fish are all swimming. And that really speaks to what is so incredibly important about the Tonle Sap. It is an organic machine for producing fish. The challenge is there's not necessarily a dam on the Tonle Sap River, uh, but there's dams that are upstream, including the dams all the way upstream in China. Recently, they've begun to affect the water that's flowing downstream. The supply chains of all the water and nutrients and fish that flow into that lake, those supply chains are getting disrupted, and then the fish factory of Tonle Sap won't be able to produce fish anymore. Further downstream, the creeping crisis could get even more severe. We think about rivers as being a flow of water, but rivers are also a flow of sediment, and that's why rivers look brown. And that's sand and silt and clay that's eroding from the mountains, and when the river meets the ocean, the sediment drops out, it accumulates, it builds and builds and builds, and that's what's called a delta. But even as the delta is growing, there's a set of forces that are trying to tear it down. So the waves are crashing on it. If the delta didn't have new sediment, it would sink and shrink. It would just begin to disappear. And of course, the sea level is rising now because of climate change. And so the Mekong Delta 
depends on the river bringing its sediments every year to keep it healthy and growing. And the Mekong Delta is phenomenally important. It's something like 20 million people in Vietnam live on the Delta. 90% of the rice that is exported is grown on the Mekong Delta. The Mekong has already lost, I think, about 60% of its sediment supply. If the rest of the proposed dams are built, it would lose something like 95% of its sediment supply. Scientists have modeled what would happen if that were to happen, and much of the delta would be under the ocean by the end of this century. Thinking about a place that's home to 20 million people and all of that important agriculture beginning to slip under the waves, and that in you know, my kid's lifetime could be underwater, that's a scary proposition. There are more than 100 dams that have been built or are in the process of being built on the Mekong and its tributaries. This presents the region's governments with a choice. They can protect the citizens' food supply and the ecosystem, or they can continue to build large dams. This is the University of Tehran in Iran. Chinese is a popular class here. Here in Iran, the Belt and Road Initiative has heralded the arrival of several Confucius Institutes designed to teach the language and promote China and Chinese values. Woman 然后我可以装很多钱。正好国家有着一带一路差异，我们也有这个机会，哎，世界哈，变成了个地球村，说我们都喜欢来伊朗看看古代的像那个波斯和中国他们交往的情况，然后看看现在我们再看看能重拾友
was seen by many analysts as a clear sign that the BRI has implications beyond business and connectivity. Look at Saudi Arabia or Iran. In China become the largest uh, energy importers and particularly Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, China is the, uh, their destination for their main export uh, uh, for the, their petroleum and energy. And so China also, the influence of the geopolitical uh, uh, persuasion power has also gone up and uh, that's why since China is the large trade partner of both Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran and China is the uh, Belt and Road partner for both countries, uh, it naturally for China to say, look, I mean, we can't go on like this, we can't fight each other, we need to really uh, calm down and make peace out of this. The strategy is for China to move into uh, areas of the world where the United States is becoming less influential and the Middle East is one of those. And so, for instance, it's Iran-Saudi deal. Um, China uh, wants to be seen as a major player internationally and therefore its ability to broker or to try and broker these kind of peace deals there in Ukraine would be another example. Uh, it adds prestige to, to Beijing's external diplomacy um, as well as building influence in a region like the Middle East. Another place where China has increasing political clout? Africa. With more than one billion consumers, the youngest demographic in the world, and one third of the world's mineral resources. Africa has been an area of focus for China, even from the Mao Zedong days. Hence, it is no surprise that the Belt and Road has been baked here with a string of railways, roads, ports, mines and factories across the region. Just another morning at the Huatian Shoe Factory in Ethiopia. This company is founded by former Chinese soldier Zhang Huarong. Hence, discipline and drills are part of corporate culture. This factory in Ethiopia was set up in 2013. Today, it has an annual production capacity of 3 million pairs of shoes for export, making it one of the largest export enterprises in the country. Huatian used to make shoes for Ivanka Trump's fashion label, but ties were cut after President Trump started a trade war with China. It continues to make shoes for many other big international labels. Zai 東南亞基本上也開始飽和,已經追逐的中國的步伐基本上飽和到了。China overtook the US as the largest trading partner with Africa by 2009. Africa has been really important for China's Belt and Road Initiative not only in terms of kind of on a numer in a numerical sense how large China's trade is with Africa um, Africa is also, of course, a huge, um, huge recipient of Chinese foreign direct investment. But I think more, thinking more symbolically and in terms of China's evolution as a development partner, China has been promoting its approach as especially focused on South-South cooperation. And China has been trying to position itself um, as an alternative to traditional aid donors. One of the biggest BRI railway projects on the continent is this one in Kenya, which opened to much fanfare. The 
today I am once again delighted to take note of the support that we have received as a government and a people by the government and of the People's Republic of China, their various development partners and China Road and Bridge Corporation. I want to thank them for being true friends of Kenya's growth and development agenda. That was then. It has since become a political issue. During elections in 2022, leading candidates had intense debates about whether to deport Chinese workers doing local jobs. They questioned how extensive corruption is on the project and how Kenya will pay back its debt to China. The China designed, funded and built railway cost almost 5 billion US dollars. And with the pandemic hitting economic growth, Kenya has since struggled to pay back the Chinese loans. China is now Africa's biggest bilateral creditor. And this has prompted domestic and international debates about the risk of African countries falling into debt trap diplomacy. One of the major Western criticisms of BRI has centered around the phrase debt trap diplomacy, the notion that China has deliberately entrapped uh, developing countries with excessive debts in order so that over time uh, that will benefit China. So for instance, you, uh, you give debt to a project, a port, for instance, um, they can't repay it and you turn that debt into equity so China eventually ends up owning the port. I think that's a little bit cynical. I don't think China deliberately did this. I think often it simply happened by accident that the BRI was a very decentralized um, uh, set of projects. China was often quite generous in the amount of money that it was willing to loan. Um, often a lot of that money disappeared um, uh, into people's pockets as opposed to into projects. So I don't think people in Beijing were deliberately trying to set these debt traps. But often the result was the same. Countries borrowed unsustainable levels they weren't able to repay. And even if China then didn't turn the debt into equity, uh, it did create a, a problem. One of the ways of looking at this is the terms of Chinese loans compared to other types of donors. And a huge number of Chinese loans have been concessional loans. They're below market rates. Um, and then if you compare to the majority of, of lenders, especially in Africa and other, other more debt-stressed countries, uh, large amounts of that debt is coming from private lenders who lend at much higher rates. There's a lot of uh, speculation, even uh, misinterpretation of China's uh, you know, project cooperation in Africa, which I think is now substantiated. If you look at the uh, Chinese government, Chinese uh, uh, initiatives in Africa and also in the, in the G20 uh, documents, China is really uh, working with the international community to help Africa getting out of this uh, uh, debt situation if some country has that challenges. But with China itself now facing economic headwinds, what lies ahead for the Belt and Road? The world has seen 10 years of huge infrastructure projects brought by the Belt and Road Initiative. Multi-billion dollar ports, railways and power projects, all financed with Chinese money and built by Chinese companies. But now, the Belt and Road Initiative seems to be undergoing some belt tightening. Over the earlier stages, about 10 years ago, China was lending enormous amounts of money every year, uh, tens of billions, almost 100 billion a year. I don't think we're going to go back to that. China is no longer interested in uh, giving away free money to build very expensive transboundary rail, transborder railways. Um, a lot of things have changed. By 2016, 2017, China's leaders were realizing that a lot of loans had made that been made that were quite risky investments. So we've seen a decline since 2016, and then a really drastic drop since kind of the COVID years. In the last few years, especially, we've seen a number of like a, an astonishing number of loans that have been assessed as non-performing and have been written off. Um, and 
China has also been issuing rescue loans to certain kind of sovereign actors that are determined to be in too much debt distress. So, so there is significant belt tightening, and I think that's a reaction to lessons learned in uh, the boom of investment overseas that was happening kind of in the early 2010s. Observers say the new focus of the BRI is on the small and beautiful, a term coined by President Xi. So small is beautiful is the Chinese government kind of shifting to smaller projects, and this is smaller in terms of capital invested, but also um, smaller in terms of the size of projects, just the area. Um, and so we see a shift towards smaller projects, but there's also an emphasis on quality. So this is a real shift, especially for a country that um, domestically China has had a lot of success in these establishment of these huge me mega projects. But I think that Chinese leaders have recognized that implementing mega projects overseas by moving beyond uh, the domestic context. They are all not a number of factors that they can't control as well, and that just has increased the amount of risk that's involved in these mega projects. So shifting to smaller projects seems, uh, seems wise. The numbers reflect this approach. Loans to Africa from China, for example, dropped from a high of $28.4 billion in 2016 to about $1.9 billion in 2020. The nature of these commercial deals is also changing. Small and beautiful. For example, in like a digital Silk Road, you know, China is a great uh, uh, second largest digital economy in the world. Probably we could do more digital stuff uh, where you don't need too much infrastructure. And then also some uh, environmental projects and also even clean technology. And of course, education is also another good thing, you know, more, more technical vocational school. In the last year, China has also put more emphasis on the three global initiatives compared to the Belt and Road. These are the Global Civilization Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, and the Global Security Initiative. Those uh, the three initiatives proposed by President Xi is really complementary to the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, if you talk about global uh, development initiative, which is really in corresponding to the UN 2030 uh, development agenda. And then you talk about the global security initiative, which is also if you want to build, if you want to construct, and if you want to have an economic cooperation, you need a stable, secure environment. China also proposed the global civilization initiative, which is, I mean, uh, we need to, uh, you know, really uh, have a dialogue of civilizations. We should find a way to how to cooperate with each other. We need to talk to each other. A hospital in Laos demonstrates the Global Development Initiative at work. ผมหมอกหมู่สงครามพวกเขาสร้างมาได้สร้างถือว่าบรรดาตึกเก่าถือว่าถือว่าถึกอนาทุกมางออกและสร้างตึกใหม่ทดแทนวันที่ 15 ๆๆตั้งแต่เดือนนึงสมพันธ์ซ้องๆมาฮอดปัจจุบันI tend to think of the Belt and Road Initiative as a powerful slogan, and so I think in that sense, as a slogan, I think the Belt and Road Initiative has run its course in many senses. Um, it motivated people for five to ten years, and I think that it's it's used less and less because a campaign slogan cannot be used in perpetuity. Um, but I think that the underlying reasons behind the Belt and Road Initiative, I think they remain. The impetus for China to need to kind of 
fix its overaccumulation and its overcapacity and in infrastructure overseas. I think that need remains, um, perhaps kind of tampered, uh, perhaps tempered a bit by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but I think that China still needs to expand globally to remain stable. Um, and I think that the rest of the world still needs China's expertise in infrastructure capacity, and there will be a demand for that going forward. So the underlying motivations for the Belt and Road Initiative, I think, will continue. And China's, you know, its, it's three new strategies, I think, reflect the fact that it may not use the same terms Belt and Road anymore, but it is still planning on continuing to expand um, and strengthen its overseas engagements. What I hope is that for the future, uh, Belt and Road, uh, Belt and Road Center can be more mortalized. We could have an international steering committee. We could have a, a secretary office. Uh, we could have many more countries of Belt and Road countries to join this uh, uh, Belt and Road Center. For example, we could set up an international Belt and Road Center uh, that all the member countries can come in. And we can also uh, not only have a Belt and Road Summit in Beijing, but also we can have it in Geneva, or in Singapore, or in uh, in, in, in uh, different parts of the world, uh, uh, in Paris, for example. Let's all get all the world work together on the climate change, on the green infrastructure, on, on all the uh, digital economy. So let's all work together.